Hi, welcome to the next of our series of mini lectures. Uh, we're moving on with the second day of understanding basic optical principles in the design of the zoom lens. As we've talked about last time, and I'm not going to go over this too much, um, what we're really doing is trying to come up with appropriate and conceptual mathematical models of how light behaves. And that's what we're going to continue with today as far as looking at actual engineering design and lenses and things like that. Those will be in the coming weeks. And so really what we're going to do today is, is hit on some really basic principles that aren't directly related to the design of the zoom lens, but have very much a lot to do with how light propagates. And I'm going to warn you that this is actually a very deep topic we're going to cover today. And uh, you can really get into a lot of mathematical detail on this, which we're going to skip. But I'll give you some keywords to go on so you can look things up on your own if you're interested. So essentially what we've done so far is we've seen that light can behave as a quantum mechanical particle, uh, which is complex and valid, and we're not going to use that quite yet. We also see that light behaves as a wave, and we don't use that model either, although we're going to hint at some of the wave properties today. Um, what we're interested in understanding is the geometric optics or ray model, that individual particles of light move in straight lines or rays unless they hit a boundary, which is defined as a change in an index of refraction. These boundaries, of course, have to be much, much larger than the wavelength of light for this model to make sense. And also we draw from geometry and mathematics in being able to infinitely look closer and closer and closer and the ray doesn't get bigger and bigger, it continues to get smaller and smaller because a line essentially has zero width. And we'll see how that works in just a minute. Uh, remember that the index of refraction can be defined a couple of ways. Um, it's the speed of light in vacuum divided by the speed of light in material. Um, and since light goes slower in materials, essentially an index of refraction is the ratio of these speeds. The higher the index, the slower the material goes. And, of course, because of Snell's law, it also is a measure of how much a boundary bends light. And the ratio of the indices, with some signs throw in, determine that. As we learned last time, there are two basic rules. There's the law of reflection that says if a ray or this idealized geometrical model of light hits a boundary, theta 1 and theta 2 are going to be equal. Uh, if you have refraction, in other words, it going from one index of refraction in 1 to another index of refraction in 2 here, the ratio of sine theta 1 to sine theta 2 is given by Snell's law, which is determined by the index of refraction and the sines of the angles. And we did some calculations with this last time. So if you don't remember this, go back and watch uh, uh, the last uh, mini-lecture. The third principle that we're going to hit today is Huygens' principle. And here what we have is slightly more complicated. We have our ray of light coming in, but at every point in space, and I'm just showing one point in space, we can think of the the ray radiating out in all directions in a spherical phase front. And I'm drawing it in two dimensions because I can't draw in three dimensions here. And we know that the distance from this point to any point on this is equal because it's a sphere. There are all the radius. And so the ray could propagate in any of these directions. Um, and to, to really make sense of Huygens' principle, which is very historical because it's one of the the first insights into how light really works from the 17th century. And we're really covering it more for historical accuracy more than anything else, although it does provide some insight into how light works. Let's take a look at this geometrical concept of a ray and go into this idea of a ray anymore by really blowing that sucker up. So here's this ray blown up to a very large scale. Um, of course, we know that any line or any, any ge or mathematical object, geometrical object, can be subdivided into an infinite number of smaller objects. So I can take this ray right here, and that one ray can equally well be represented as three rays. And if I go in on a more magnified, magnified scale and look more closely, any one of these rays can be represented by three smaller rays ad infinitum. In other words, I can keep cutting these rays down into smaller and smaller pieces. And this is essentially... Uh, calculus that we're starting to develop here. Um, but let's go back and see how that impacts Huygens' principle. Uh, so this one ray really isn't one ray. It's essentially a lot of rays, a ray bundle, if you will. And the word bundle is used to describe these, these groups or packages of rays. So I can go on and keep adding ray bundles here. And so my ray is really composed of a lot of rays, each of which hits a point and propagates out, out in all directions. And now we start to see something interesting in that this one ray that is subdivided into a lot of rays, each propagating from a point, the, the 
direction of propagation, the phase front, in other words, the place where all these spheres intersect, happens to be a line like that. And this line is going to radiate at, at each point on this line. These points are going to radiate in all directions. And the place where they all add up in phase, the, the natural line, the tangent to the surface made by all these individual phase fronts is that. And the ray propagates and propagates and propagates. So what Huygens' principle really says in a, a way is it's the way we understand in a basic sense why light goes in a straight line. Uh, because of Huygens' principle, because even though each of these points in space or each of these points in material can radiate in all directions, the way they all add up in phase, the way that, that the, the phase front builds is in one direction. And we can keep going at an item that way. Uh, this idea can also work if we have light not in a planar phase front, but say in a circular or spherical phase front, i.e. lots of rays coming out in different directions. Huygens principle works equally well here because you see if we do this, the phase front actually that we draw is in fact curved like that. Um, there's another thing hidden in Huygens principle uh, that's very important in geometrical optics. If we look at one point on this phase front, you see that in fact if we zoom in close enough, any point on a phase front can be represented as a planar phase front or a ray going in one direction. So we can always, in an optical system, zoom in as closely as we want so a surface always looks flat and a ray is always coming in in one direction. So we can always work with a planar geometry in our idealized picture of geometrical optics. Uh, hopefully that clears up some of what Huygens' principle means and why it's important to understand why rays go in a direction. But really this is more historical than anything else and this is really the last time we're going to deal with Huygens' principle in this class.